Well, I like to fish. I'm not that great at it. But you don't have to be real great at fishing to tell fishing stories, do you? (laughs) Anybody ever told a fishing story before? Come on! Somebody's telling me a story right now, aren't you? Fishing stories are those things that when people are telling you, you're not quite sure if you believe what they're saying. I mean, there's all kinds of fishing stories out there. Actually, Doug and Bethany and myself, we went fishing a couple of weeks ago. Now, you probably think I'm joking about that, but we really did. We went fishing at one of our uh, members' house, and we probably fished, I don't know, five or six hours. And between Doug and I, just Doug and I alone, we caught a whole four whopping fish. Pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, it's, how many times have you gone fishing and not caught anything? Don't you laugh at our four fish we caught. But what, do you know what gets me, though? We fished probably for five or six hours, caught four fish. The guy and, uh, who was, uh, we were fishing at his and his wife's house, the guy came out there. He fished for about ten minutes and caught four. <laughs> what do you do? But what I want to make sure you all know is out of those four fish that Doug and I caught, I caught the biggest I mean, that fish, look, you see the proof right there. I mean, it had to be that big. Now, somebody said when you hold it out in front of you, it looks, let's show the real picture just so you'll know that I did catch. See, those are some pretty good sized fish, aren't they? I still caught the biggest of those two. Fishing stories. What about the guy who had fished all day on the lake? He had a terrible day fishing. He didn't catch anything. So on his way home, he stopped by the fish market. (laughs) And he said to the guy at the fish market, he said, I want four rainbow trout, but I want you to throw them to me. Guy says, you want me to throw them to you? He says, yeah, that way when I say I caught them, I won't be lying. (laughs) Well, The guy said, okay, he said, but I just think I should tell you, you should probably get the salmon instead. What? He said, yeah, because your wife was by here a little bit ago, and she said, when you do come by, make sure you get the salmon. (laughs) Right? What about the two fellas that weren't so bright? They went fishing one day. Oh, I knew that was coming. I'm not even going to look up there. I'm not even going to look. Two other guys besides those that are probably on the screen behind me. Two other not so bright guys go fishing. They catch a whole lot of fish. And when they got back to the, to the dock, the one guy turns to the other guy and he says, man, we sure did catch a whole lot of fish. I hope we can remember where we caught all them. The other not so bright guy says, that's okay. He said, I leaned over and put an X right on the side of the boat so we would remember. (laughs) And the other guy says, you idiot. How you know we're going to get the same boat? (laughs) Fishing stories. They're fun to tell, aren't they? Some are funny and some are exaggerated. Um, But fishing stories. Now, one of my favorite fishing stories is an amazing story, and it's a true story. And it comes from the Scripture. And that's why I want to draw your attention to today. It's an awesome story. I mean, it's a miraculous fishing story. It really is. And it's neat to tell. It's neat to read, especially when you think about how we like to tell fishing stories, right? So in your Bibles, if you would, turn with me to John chapter 21. Now, that'll be on the screen if you don't happen to have a Bible with you or uh, if there's not one in the chair in front of you. Uh, But if you have your Bibles or your iPads or your smartphones or your not-so-smartphones or whatever, follow along with me. John 21, the great one of the greatest fishing stories ever to be told. John 21. 21. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. Now it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them and said, and the rest said, well, I'll go with you. We'll go with you. So they went out and they got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but now the the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. 
he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? Now, I have to stop and I have to say this. One of the worst things about going fishing and not catching any fish is when the next fisherman comes along and said, y'all catch anything? <laughs> Isn't that one of the worst things about fishing and not? Because then you just, you just kind of hang your head low. No, we well, haven't caught anything. Or you'll say, no, we just got here or just got here might have been an hour or two, right? But that's one of the worst things when you're not catching anything. So, so, so Jesus says, they didn't realize it was him. Haven't you any fish? No, they answered. Verse 6. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of a large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him and jumped into the water. Now, okay, I have to tell you, when I first saw that, I thought, what? He had his outer garment off so he could get in the water. So now why is he putting it on to get in the water? Because, you know, when they went fishing with those nets, oftentimes they had to have a, a guy get out in the water, a swimmer, get out there to kind of help with the nets and get it in. So he didn't have a whole lot of clothes on. As Doug said, he might even been naked. <laughs> or close to it, what they would call. You know the difference between naked and buck naked, right? Naked, you have your socks on. So this guy probably had his socks on. So he wasn't buck naked. But he did that so that he could get in the water. But now he sees... When he, after he catches all this fish and John points out and says, Hey, look, that's Jesus. And then Peter gets all excited. He wants to get to the shore really quick. So he does. He gathers up his belongings, what happened to be his outer garment. He jumps in the water, probably even helped pull the boat in because they were only about a hundred yards off and they had to get the boat in. So he was excited. He wasn't playing around. And you got to think about this. This was between the resurrection and the ascension. Now, we already know that Peter was very zealous, and, and Peter loved the Lord. And, and Peter, I mean, he was the first one to draw a sword when they came to arrest Peter. <clears throat> but there was that time when our Lord and his Lord seemed like that everything had just stopped. You know, these guys had left everything to follow Jesus. Peter had left it all to follow Jesus, and then they witnessed as he hung on the cross. And when he was laid in the tomb, and so you can imagine, the emo- Peter, Peter was a very emotional guy. You can imagine what he went through. And then when he realized that his Lord had risen again, and, you know, just again, so every opportunity from that point on, I'm sure that Peter's kicking it to get to Jesus. Because he knew what it was like not to be with him. He knew what it was like to have that feeling of it all being over. So Peter, he jumps out real quick, gathers his garment and goes. Verse 8. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a 100 yards. Verse 9. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals, There were fish on it and some bread. Now, these must have been some fish that either Jesus caught or got somewhere else because these weren't the fish that they had caught. Then Jesus said to them in verse 10, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat, dragged the net ashore, and it was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, why 153? Is there something significant about the 153? You know, there's a lot of people have a whole bunch of time on their hands. I got a headache this week looking at the 100, you know, everybody's idea of what, why 153? To mathematical equations of phrases. What? It just, I've literally got a headache and thinking these guys don't have anything else better to do than to try to figure out Listen, when you tell a fishing story, you tell how many you caught, don't you? I just think it's pretty simplistic. And, and, and in the fact that it kind of validates the story, where, you know, to be exact, we caught 153. How many did you fish you catch? We caught 20. How many fish did you catch? We went fishing today, we caught 40. Now, one guy says, 
Well, that 153 represents the 153 different species of fish in that day. (laughs) Who, who at that time knew that? I don't know, but God guess whatever they want to do, right? It caught a lot of fish and there's 153 of them. That's impressive. That's a fishing story to tell. We fished all night long, didn't catch anything, and this guy comes up and says, throw it down there. We caught 153 in one cast. That's a fishing story. And it's an amazing fishing story because Jesus was involved. <clears throat> but before Jesus was involved, the nets were empty. And we're finishing up our sermon series on empty. And the idea that we put across is because the tomb was empty, everything else in our life that is empty can be full, right? Because Jesus rose from the dead, because he conquered sin and death, not just the fact that he died for us, but he conquered. He's, he's a conqueror. We're more than conquerors. He's an overcomer. We're more than overcomers because the grave that held Jesus was empty, Everything else in your life that is empty can be full and doesn't have to remain empty and we can have a better perspective about it because of the empty tomb. So today we're talking about these empty nets that these disciples have. And and, and that's thinking about the empty purpose or the unfulfilled purposes in our life. Anybody ever feel unfulfilled in your life? Anybody ever have something that they were going to do, something they were supposed to do, and they came up empty? It just didn't seem like it was working. These guys were fishermen that went fishing. These guys were fishermen by trade. This isn't the first fishing story that these guys can tell. They can tell the story even when Jesus came to call them to follow him. They were fishing that day too. Before Jesus started his ministry, they were fishing. And it was about the same thing. They had fished all day, hadn't caught anything. Then Jesus comes along, and they catch so many fish that time that their nets began to break. Because when Jesus shows up, he changes everything. Amen? Jesus makes all things full. He took the empty nets, the purpose of fishing, the failures of fishing, and he brought success. That's what Jesus does. And I want to encourage us today to make sure that the lives that we are living are full of purpose. That our nets are full. And I'm not talking about our bank account or our possessions. I'm talking about our purpose. That our reason for living. That our surrendering to Christ. Our willingness to follow him and serve him. That what we are doing doesn't produce empty nets. And so... One thing that I want to encourage us is, is if we're going to make sure that we don't have empty nets, we need to make sure that we are in Jesus' time. We need to be in his time. Because a lot of things, a lot of times we do things in our time, don't we? I'll get to it. Husbands are really notorious for that. You know, after the third month asking when they were going to fix that dripping faucet, I'll get to it. We just like to be consistent. You asked us that last week, that's what we told you. You asked us a week before, that's what we told you. You know, you asked us last year, that's what we told you. We just want to be consistent. We like to do things in our time, though, don't we? When we are ready. And unfortunately, that happens to those at the very beginning, or even before they surrender to Christ. People who have a knowledge of the Creator. People know that it was actually who believe that actually God created the universe. People who believe that Jesus existed. People who believe that Jesus was even the Son of God. People who believe that it is through Jesus that they need to receive salvation. But for some reason, they say, but not now. Man, if you know those things, if you really know those things, why would you put them off some other time? Because if God is the Creator... And if Jesus is the Savior, if Jesus was a good man, if he knew what he was talking about, then you're in hot water. Why put it off? But you see, we are so used to doing things in our time. 
Do it on my schedule. I want to encourage you, whether it's receiving Jesus for the first time or whether it's being obedient every day of your life to serve him and something he puts in front of you, be in his time. Now, these disciples were in his time. Now, they were between the resurrection and the ascension. You know, before Jesus gave up his life, before he was arrested and trialed and he gave up his life, they were following Jesus. And they were doing, you know, sometimes Jesus even sent them out on their own. But this was a time he, they, Jesus had, had died, he had rose again, he hadn't yet ascended, he hadn't yet talked about the Holy Spirit coming upon them. So they were kind of in an in-between time. They were waiting. And sometimes Jesus' time is for you to wait. It's his, his time. It may be an awkward, that had to be awkward for them. As a matter of fact, they were probably pretty fidgety. We're waiting on Jesus, we're waiting on Jesus. Peter says, hey, I'm going to go fishing. So the other guy said, hey, we'll go with you, Jack. (laughs) So they go fishing. They were in his time. They were waiting on Jesus. And they were fishing at the right time, too. They were fishing at night. That was a time there, especially there where they were fishing. Great opportunity to catch fish. So they were in his time. You and I need to be in his time. In in, uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, or excuse me, Matthew 8, 21 through 22, a large crowd had gathered near Jesus. And verse 18 says, when they gathered around him, he gave orders to cross the other side of the lake. Now, this is another occasion. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. And then in verse 21, there's another, another disciple, another follower, somebody who was listening anyway. I don't know if they had quite yet followed him, but they were listening to him. They knew he was a teacher, so they called him a disciple. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Well, yeah, I'm going to do that for Jesus, but first I want to finish my education. First I want to get married. First I want to make sure I get this house that I want. First I want to make sure I do this. First I want to, I'll wait till I retire. You you know what I'm saying? We do just like that disciple said, let me go bury my father. And Jesus says, look, you need to let those who are dying take care of themselves. And you're following me. And the time is now. So if you know, if you have the knowledge and you know what God's calling you to do, the time is now. The Bible says today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. The time is now. The second thing we want to make sure that we are doing or that we're following to make sure that we don't have this unfulfilled purpose is to realize that not only we be, are to be in his time, but we are to be in his place. We are to be where he wants us to be, in his place. Why were these guys where they were? Because that's where Jesus told them he'd meet them. They were in his time and they were in the right place. They were right where Jesus said he'd meet them. Unfulfilled purpose in our life? Are we in his time? Are we in his place? In Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, we hear the great commission, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see, the Bible teaches us that the right place is the place you are in. Because when you look at that and it says, go, go ye, or go, The better rendering of that is as you go. You see, the right place for you is where you are to start with. As I'm going, this is where I need to be. As I'm going, now this is where I need to be. And now you're saying I need to come back up here, aren't you? As I go, that's the right place. Then he wants to make sure that we go into all the nations, right? Even when he gave the directions to these disciples before he ascended into the heavens... He said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the world. He didn't hop somewhere off in a far distance. He said, you're going to be my witnesses right where you are. 
and then you're going to spread out. We need to make sure that we are in his time and that we're in his place. The third thing is we need to make sure we are in his way, that we're doing things his way, not our way. Not only are we the kind of people that we like to do it in our time, we like to do it our way, don't we? We like to do it our way that there's that fast food commercial that says, have it your way. Sounds pretty good. I think I'll go there. You know, some, pla- some places you go to, you wonder, do they really want to give it to me my way? I went to this one place, and I said, I'd like to have a small Coke, please. They said, we don't have small. We have medium, large, and extra large. I said, give me your smallest. Give it my way. Huh? We like to do things our way. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, the Bible says there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. You see, God's way is the best way. Who's ever known his mind or whoever has known all of his reasonings, but if you know that God is the creator, you know that he is sovereign, you know that he's all-knowing, you know that he's all-powerful, you know that he's all-merciful, you know that he's all-loving, then my goodness, do it his way. Who are we to think that we're smarter than him? But it's just natural for us to do that. How many times have we read uh, instructions on putting something together? Well, I know those instructions say that, but I'm going to do it this way. Then we end up with five or six parts left over, and next week we're throwing it in the trash because we didn't do it the right way. His time, his place, his way, and his purpose. You see, we have to have the right purpose. About our life. We have to be living for him and not for ourselves. And you, you see, when we've really surrendered to his purpose, then it's easier for us to do things in his time and his place. Because that's what the disciples did. They left everything they had to follow Jesus. They'd given everything else up. They didn't hold on to something for insurance. You know, they didn't hold on to their job or put it on hold or put something in escrow. I mean, they just followed Jesus. Just flat out left their boats right there. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, when it tells us this first time that Jesus sees these guys fishing, which is in uh, Luke chapter 5, what we see there is Jesus is teaching. This is before he gathered all of his disciples. And he looks over and he sees these boats at the water's edge. And the fishermen went in the boats because they were out cleaning their nets. So Jesus is teaching. He sees these boats. The Bible says in Luke chapter 5 that he just comes over and he just sits down on that boat. And he just keeps teaching. Then he looks over to the owner, who happened to be Simon, and he said, hey, take this thing out a little ways. So the Bible teaches us there in Luke chapter 5 that they took the boat out a little bit further and he continued to teach. Then when he was done teaching on the boat of Simon, who had been fishing for a long time already, and his partners, he looked at him and says, hey, take this boat out a little bit further. And throw your nets out there. And then that is the story in Luke chapter 5, where Simon says, you know what, we've been fishing for a whole long time. And, you know, I'm thinking, he's probably thinking we're tired. We've not caught anything. This is a bad day. Then the owner comes out in 10 minutes to catch us four fish. <laughs> he comes out. He tells them to throw. But but Simon said, because you say so, we'll do it. And they catch so many fish that other people in other boats had to come over to help them haul in the fish. Now, you thought the first fishing story we looked at after Jesus was resurrected was a good story. This is a great story, too. And they, they were so moved by this. This Simon was like, you know what, Jesus, you need to stay away from me because I'm a sinner. He recognized at that point that not only was Jesus a good teacher, you know, he recognized that at first because he was willing to do what he said. But after that, Peter was sold. Why did he draw the sword in the garden? Because he was sold out. Why did he do all these things for Jesus? Why was he so exuberant? Because he was sold out. Because that day when he had fished all day and was tired, probably frustrated, (coughs) Jesus shows up and sits on his boat. And Jesus said, you know what, Simon, 
don't worry about your sin right now. Don't be afraid, he said. I'm going to make you fishers of men. You're not going to be fisher men anymore. You're going to be fishers of men. And that day, Peter's purpose changed. Is your life unfulfilled? Is it empty? Maybe it's because you're still a fisher man and not a fisher of man. God's time, God's place, God's way, God's purpose. And you know, sometimes we get all that. Sometimes we're in his time, we're in his place, we're doing things the way we think is his way, we're following his purpose, and we still don't see the results. Hmm? What then? Well, a couple of thoughts on that. And the first one is, sometimes we don't see the results because we're just fishing for Jesus. Or maybe we're just fishing because of Jesus. But we're not fishing with Jesus. You see, it's good to do something for Jesus, isn't it? It's good to do something because of Jesus. But it's a whole lot better to do things with Jesus. Then when we, you know, we are a very numbers driven society, aren't we? How many did you have at church on Sunday? Yeah, Somebody says, how was church Sunday? Well, he, well, it was a pretty good crowd. What, what does that mean? That had to do with what got people there to begin with. Didn't have what to do what happened once you got there, but we are a number-driven society. And so sometimes we feel full unfulfilled because we're measuring by some societal standards. But when you're with Jesus, it's all right. It's more than all right when you're with Jesus. Amen? So today as we come to a time of decision, think about where you are. And remember that day when Jesus showed up on Peter's boat. And there, if you're here today and you've never surrendered to Jesus Christ, if you believe in God and you believe in Jesus and you, you trust what he's saying, my goodness, the, t- now's the time. And he's just kind of showing up right where you are and he's just sitting down right next to you and he's just saying, you know what? Don't be afraid. Follow me. You know, that's, that's what, that's kind of God that our God is. Jesus means God with us. He's in your presence right now. And if you have a decision to make, he's beckoning you. Follow me. Here I am. Follow me, he says. And you know what? Maybe there's, this room is full of more people who've already decided to follow him. But maybe you're in between the resurrection and the ascension, like, like, you know, like, like the disciples were. Now you're between the ascension and the return. Jesus still comes alongside of you and he says, do it my way. Follow me. So as we come to this time of decision, would you heed the master's call? And would you follow him that your life, your purpose, your nets would be full? Let's stand together as we commit to him this morning.